was going to ask you, uh, you, you're a veteran, mm -hmm. and so I'm guessing that's going to be your answer uh, as mm -hmm. to what sort of makes you very interested in this topic. But it doesn't have to be. There are people on the task force who aren't veterans. And, and for me, in some ways, it's I'm not a veteran, and I was born in 1960, and I feel like I'm in that um, generation that was sort of like the low point in terms of yeah. percentage of people that did military service. Because mm. so my father's generation, everyone was brothers. My mother, everyone yeah. were brothers. Uh, my father, two of his sisters in World War II okay. uh, in, the, in the service. And I come out, you know. I was born in 61, so. So, but, so, but I think our generation, yeah. it's that sort of, so I think what started to happen is you look at colleges in the, in the 80s and 90s, you just had, by the numbers, smaller number of veterans on campus. And like any student population that is coming in smaller numbers, programs fall away and we sort of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, my interest is serving the veterans well on campuses. And we've had this build up, I think, in terms of number of veterans post 9-11. We've had a new GI Bill, we've had resources. Yeah. But just because Congress makes resources available doesn't mean institutions use them. are ready to use them well. Yeah. So what's, what is, how did you get motivated to come to the Veterans Task Force? Um, so I was invited on it um, after I retired. It's been up and running for a while. Um, and um, for uh, somebody else was running it who was not a veteran, it handed off to another person who was not a veteran. And I was not all that excited about participating because from my perspective, they were going down a path that didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was um, it was to prevent. I, I I don't know that they were doing it to benefit themselves because there was no self promotion, right. but it wasn't to. It, I didn't see it as a way of really benefiting veterans. And so, um, after the uh, the second person stepped down and well, actually, got hired somewhere else. Um, that's uh, where I said, okay, um, I, I really don't. I, I think there's an opportunity here to do something good for veterans, and um, so I'm interested in doing that. So I guess I wanted to start by talking about um, maybe obstacles to degree completion, because that's a big deal for every college. Mm -hmm. um, and veterans typically are more likely to be married. Right. They're more likely to arrive on campus. They're certainly um, older than... That's what I'm saying, they're more likely to arrive older. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's really why they're more likely to be married. It's not, a, it's not something about being a veteran, it's right. you get older. Um, and they're more likely to, their first semester on campus, not be living on campus. Mm -hmm. Again, because they're older. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, those things can be obstacles to degree. So do you see that in the veterans that come to JMU? And what are some of the ways that you kind of try, try to help them stay on track? Um, most of the veterans that I've worked with come with some credits, mm -hmm. so they're, um, even their first year on campus, they're probably not first freshman status, Right. most of them. Um, and uh, I see a lot of their interest is in, um, they've got 36 months of benefits, and they, how do I get that, how do I get it completed right. in that amount of time? So, um, so for, those, for those folks, there's a challenge because they are, um, their veterans' benefits may not be sufficient to cover their costs. Right. And so they've got to work, especially if they're married and living off campus, they, they end up working and trying to be a student full time. And, um, and, and those are, the challenge I think is that um, when, when, you're, when you're deployed, when you're on a ship, when you're doing whatever, and you're taking one class at a time, and it's usually online or, or, or through um, one of the contracted institutions, um, it, for whatever reason, it may be easier to stay focused on that one class at a time and get it done, and maybe they give you more time to work on things. Um, but when you're on campus and you're taking 15 credits all at the same time and trying to work, and the classes might be a little more rigorous, um, you've you've gone past the high school plus courses, if you will. Right. You know they're um, the kind of those those AP dual uh, enrollment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're you're past that now. You're really starting to get into your major, and you didn't have an opportunity to make that transition 
as a true freshman, right. um, some of them struggle a little bit. Um, and and so uh, so helping them figure that out, I think, is uh, is a real challenge. Uh, actually, what I've seen is, um, and I'll, I had a lot more experience with this while I was doing ROTC because I ran the ROTC right. program here. Um, students would come in and they say, "Okay, I've got all this done. I've I finished my first two years, and I only have two years left to do. So I got to get this done in two years." And I say, "Okay, um, that's great." And that might happen, but let's think about what happens if it's a third year. Right. Um, and so, uh, so let's just talk about that, or at least maybe two and a half. Um, and what are the options? And so, how do you set those guys up for success? So, start with taking 18 credits and drop a class um, in the first week or so. so. You know, you figure out okay, what what's the workload going to be? How are you going to get along with your instructor, um, and be able to drop a class. Um, so that you maintain full-time status and, and you graduate or you mm -hmm. complete that semester with 15 successful credits. Um, to me, that's a, th that, that turned out to be a pretty decent approach. Sometimes they'd even get down to 12 credits where you're still full-time, so you could drop two classes. Right. If you start with 18, figure out which ones that you are going to connect with, um, and then you know maybe you take a couple in the summer. Th those are things that we can work out, and uh, that seemed to work pretty well. And yeah, because I think that's true about students, not just veterans. Oh. It's hard to predict, looking to any, any two-year plan, what you're going to yeah. connect with, what's yeah. the best course for you to take within a major, yeah. even if you're going to stay in the same major. Right. Um, and having that 36-month benefit mm -hmm. window mm -hmm. forces you to just be more disciplined about it. Yeah, and, uh, and, so, and sometimes that's a problem because the course you want to take yeah. is not offered every semester and so you're coming in kind of out of sequence with everybody else um, most people took that as a freshman and now you're kind of coming in as a right. second year and and so you find out that there's a prerequisite you can't take the second year courses because there's a prerequisite even though you um, you've taken a bunch of you've got 30 credits but they don't all line up right those kinds of things is JMU have some flexibility on that to try to um, they they do and I've I've seen them be very flexible with um, you know, typically some, you know, you come in with some sort of a, a class that is kind of similar to a right. prereq that um, they'll often give you an opportunity to, um, okay, we'll, we'll take this as an exception, we'll allow you to try the course, um, and then, you know, if, if you run into problems, then let us know early and we'll drop the course for you. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's good. They, that's... I, I've seen them work really hard to, to help out veterans. Right. Yeah. Any student, actually. I mean, right. I don't, no, right. not just. But it seems like it might come up slightly more often yeah. Uh, yeah. for veterans. So the other thing about a univer any university is you want almost as much learning to be happening outside the classroom as in the classroom. That's part of the university experience. Right. And again, to go back to where we started with, um, maybe more like married, living off campus, mm -hmm. uh, older, uh, yeah. also working maybe full time, whatever. Mm -hmm. Is that a challenge for veteran students to, to benefit from the, everything that Jamie is offering outside the classroom? Yeah, so I think it's a, uh, I, I, I took uh, master's level courses when I first got here in computer science. And, and so fr from same kind of perspective, you know, um, it was not uncommon for my classmates to want to get together at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock at night <laughs> for a work session. And I just, you know, I said like, guys, I, I have to be at work in the morning. <laughs> right. um, and I know you guys, you know, you can sleep in until 10 o'clock. I, I got to be to work. Uh, and, and so, um, yeah, I would, uh, I, I would suspect that that is a problem for any older student, right. um, any married student. And, and uh, as you said, veterans probably fill both those qu categories more. And not just 10, not, some of the best conversations are not just at 10, 10 p.m. They're at 2 a.m. 2 a.m., that's right. They, they, yeah, they'll, they'll go way late and, uh, you know, it just doesn't doesn't work so well for married folks. But the things you offer here, like the pop-up classes yep. with the X-Lab and, and different, maybe a guest lecture by somebody or right. different things, are veterans who's able to take advantage of that, do you think? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, now, you know, uh, uh, at last count, I think we had around 250 veteran students. Okay. Um, so we don't, ha out of 20,000, it's, you know, it's not even a rounding area yet. Um, <laughs> So um, we, we have had, 
I, I know of two or three veterans that came in, and you can identify them right away. They are older. Yeah. They have short hair. Um, they call you sir, even, <laughs> even when, and, and, uh, and are, you know, you're, you're a veteran, yeah. Uh, so, so they kind of stick out, but so we've had two or three of them come by and, and take classes. We've had a lot of the ROTC students right. that uh, end up taking classes um, that, and some of those may qualify as veterans because they might have done a few years in the Guard Reserve before coming here as a student, so. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, it's also probably true that on average, maybe probably because they're older, but the different experiences they've had, mm -hmm. they're gonna bring to campus a little more experience with leadership than maybe a typical student. Not that non-veterans, they're great student leaders. I'm yeah. not trying to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question is, in terms of student organization involvement and participating in that, is that, do you see veterans able to? to um, you know, I think time? you're probably, Jen Taylor's probably better able to answer that question about what, um, how student involved. My guess is that uh, students are, veteran students are probably not as involved in clubs and right. other kinds of traditional student organizations. I, I would suspect that there are very few of them involved in fraternities and sorority activities. Um, and you know, your various clubs that might pop up just because they're older and they're like not, right. they're kind of past that stage. Yeah, that's a fair um, point. Uh, but they're certainly, if they have the time, yeah. there's no barrier to that. Right. I, there's no barrier to it, yeah. and I think the, um, the younger students welcome them. I don't think there's a, on, on this campus anyway, I, uh, yeah. And so, let's, let's, so you're also involved with the X-Lab. Right. Let's, 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 what does the X-Lab do? In 2011, we were asked to um, participate in a program called For Virginia. And For Virginia, one of the goals was to share courses between the institutions. And so the X-Lab was created in, um, well, we, we, tried, we tried to share courses across the installations, uh, and they particularly want us to share STEM courses. So okay. STEM courses is cutting metal, you know, doing things, making things, and, um, and they gave us a room very much like this. And the faculty walked in and said, you know, uh, we're not cutting anything on those tables, you know, that's, that's not gonna work. <laughs> and so, um, we, we started growing the program. We started sharing a lot of, of language courses, some poli-sci courses, uh, um, a couple of biology courses. And um, so the, in, the, the administration saw that we were actually making it work and realized that the, the room that we were given was an impediment to actually meeting our mission. So uh, in a, uh, probably around 2012 or 13, they bought this building and then it took them a couple of years to get it renovated, but they, they asked if we wanted this space, and so we have this space in the lab next door, and um, that was designed to enable us to share STEM courses. Um, when, when I had uh, gone out to other, the other universities that are part of the program and sh said, okay, what, what, what is your STEM lab, you know, what do your STEM labs look like? Uh, it didn't look exactly like that, but, but it was clearly a usable space um, they were not video conference or anything. So, right. so we came up with the idea of you know, the, the lab as a way of um, enabling us to share those STEM courses. Um, and it's just kind of taken off. Um, the the multidisciplinary problem-based uh, courses uh, appeal to both students and faculty mm -hmm. um, much more than I expected. Um, the, the, and and it, it's, kind of created an innovation pipeline because w when you're, when you ask students to, you know, participate in our, we, we have a really strong Center for Entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. um, but when you ask students to come up with an innovative idea if they're in the Center for Entrepreneurship, they, there's, they're typically a, a, a very narrow selection of solutions or, or products that they'll come up with. Most of them nowadays are apps, right. uh, dating apps, parking apps, social media apps. Maybe a shopping app. Shopping app, some, something like that. So, um, and, and those are well-worn territory, right. um, trying, to, trying to expand, you know, I have a better dating app than you do, or I have a better music app than you do. Uh, that nobody wants to buy them. And so, right. um, so by, by putting students in front of really, we call it wicked problems, really ugly, like homelessness. We're not gonna solve it. 
Right. But um, what we do is we, we show them a process of breaking the problem down into its elements and addressing the pieces that you can solve. And so if, if everybody's doing that um, globally, then you start to eliminate some of those problems because you know, we're, we may be able to solve a piece, somebody else solves another piece, um, pretty soon you, know, you start to actually get some momentum going. And in solving those kinds of wicked problems, the students find that they're actually creating intellectual property or ideas or solutions that somebody might pay them to implement right. where the, the apps that they were doing, nobody wanted to pay them for. And so they, they find out that they are able to put a dent in whatever problem they're working on and that there's a, even a career path for them. In right. This. So. so it's interesting because this used to be a TV studio. That's right. Back in the day. Um, but the what I think of as the STEM departments at JMU are on the other side of campus. That's right. But you're very close to the business school. Yep. So has that helped get that center for innovation to come by s and get them away from the apps? Um, just, the, just the physical proximity. No, not so much. Okay. Um, they, they're, uh, so some of the, the, the college of businesses across the country are um, governed by an accreditation body called ACSB. And, um, and so getting those students outside the college of business requires some finesse with their accrediting body. Um, and so we're able to do it on a, on a limited scale, but not widespread. And the students that are here, if they're not in the college of business, that, that's really probably the bigger impediment is that the college of business students can come down here. Right. Um, if they have room in their, in their course load, they can come down here and take classes. But getting the students here to be able to take classes in the college of business or bring their venture in the college of business, if they're not part, if they're not accepted into the college of business, um, they don't have a 3.0 GPA and all the w whatever requirements they have. Yeah. Um, so yes. that is interesting. That sounds like that needs to be addressed at well, a level higher than JMU. Yeah, maybe. Or um, I, 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 so I, I look at it and say that you know the, the innovations are typically not coming out of the college of business. Right. The innovations are coming out of everywhere else in the college of business. What what we need is the what 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 we're lacking here is the business sense the finance and right. and how to get a business st stood up um, but that's typically not what they teach in undergraduate business schools and so um, so there's there's more of a gap there than maybe um, yeah. uh, is, is you know we probably need to have a more traditional MBA program to really close that gap where you right. have students on campus that are maybe in a, in a traditional three credit full-time status that are able to advise and they're older again you know so they've been out in business they've done things they're coming right. back to get their MBA um, and they have some experience with running their own business and they might help the younger students uh, advance but you know, I, used, don't have I used to work on Wall Street as an economist and huh. I worked with a guy who'd gone to Wharton MBA but he always and he's doing very successful at our, our bank but he he always made the point that he learned more the four years he spent running an art gallery um, before he got his MBA because his point was when you when you have to manage a business that's chronically losing money you really do learn business yeah, yeah. you know not art art galleries are tough yeah they are tough but he it made him really think hard about trying to yep. be creative about revenue and, and yeah the whole controlling costs right and, yep. which even when you're not doing art gallery you want to have those sort of skills yeah 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 so I think that's a that's certainly an area that we've been looking into is how do we how do we grow that program right we, I see a gap in two areas at JMU one is um, and, and uh, the, the folks that are we're, we're doing fine in our like our hacking for defense course where right. we get these challenges and and we follow the methodology um, and it's called lean startup methodology where they go out and talk to people and they and they keep pivoting on their idea and solution until they come up with a, a final solution and usually 15 weeks is a great amount of time and they've talked to 100 150 different stakeholders over the course of that semester um, the, the the challenge is typically that uh, the students as undergraduates don't have the technical savvy even the engineering students don't have the technical savvy to make things that are you know if they can buy it off the shelf or put it together from parts that they find 
that's one thing. But if they've actually got to right. create something new, then that's really hard. And so that combined with the lack of a traditional MBA keeps us kind of a, in, a, in a certain subset of that. And it's hard to imagine a secondary school system that's going to produce students who can come to JMU with that skill. That's yeah, hard to um, maybe. Uh, there are some. Uh, there, there are some. Uh, you know, we have a robotics program here, and those, some of those kids are really advanced on um, on the engineering side. But um, f in, for most things, they are um, getting they're they're getting electronics and um, making robots out of existing right. parts, as opposed to making you know, from scratch right. themselves. We right. have, we, every once in a while we have a, a few. We had, we had one kid that uh, um, designed and built a two cubic meter 3D printer. Um, wow. From scratch. I mean, he made the power supplies himself. He did everything. He, you know, got in little, you know, the circuit chips and stuff like that, soldered everything together, and it actually worked. Um, but he's kind of a one of a kind. Yeah, uh, yeah. That is pretty amazing. Yeah. I wanted to loop back um, to uh, veterans, and I forgot to talk about this earlier. Um, healthcare, mental health care. Because also they're typically, even if they're older, but also maybe they've had, they've been deployed mm -hmm. in a combat experience. They often have different, greater health care needs, mental health care needs, than your typical undergraduate student. Mm -hmm. And not just in Virginia, but across the country, often the, our care for veterans is not up to the up to the task. Mm. Is JMU able to address that? Is the, are the campus health center and things like that? Or are they able to? Yeah, it's, I mean that's that has uh, early on that was one of the um, a big focus of the of the task force is right. to figure out do we have what it takes? Do we have everything? And and actually, um, it's just some recent numbers. Um, I'm not sure that the college age population is any different than veterans with issues of, um, the, the issues are different. I mean, right. um, veterans might have PTSD, right. where um, your traditional college student these days, um, lots of anxiety issues, right. lots of um, suicidal ideations and thoughts, under, totally unrelated, although similar to um, some right. of the experience veterans have had. And so I, I, I'm, I'm not so sure that the average population in, of, of, of your traditional college right. student is, is different much anymore. That's really from good point. veterans. Yeah, and what um, so the, as you're saying they're different maybe problems but the same need for resources and support. Yeah, so building it up building up the and I, you know we've seen this in Virginia now just recently in the last legislative session where they uh, um, provided schools with more K12 schools with more dedicated counselors yes. and said we don't want the guidance or we don't want the social emotional counselors involved or completely tied up with advising students on um, which courses to take and right. that sort of thing. We want them freed up so they can actually take care of mental health issues. Um, and I think that was a good move. Um, and I think the same thing we're seeing on campus is that uh, the mental health issues, uh, universities are responding um, pretty and well. And you have a uh, school of social work here, you have a school of nursing, mm -hmm. you have, so are there, is there any opportunity for peer-to-peer Counseling and support, Jamie. Uh, I, you know, they're. Uh, it's a great question. I, I, I think that they have programs for that. Um, probably more like a call center, or right. you know, you can you can come by if you want during certain hours. Um, I, I don't think if 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 you're really in trouble, I don't think that they put you in that direction. But yeah, fair enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, yeah, in Arlington County, we have had um, a track to get the number of uh, social workers and counselors up in the schools. And this year, once again, it's a tight budget, and we're considering it, and we're also considering incre increasing class sizes. And I think for some of us, that's even more important. If you're going to increase the class, if you're going to have a classroom teacher mm -hmm. dealing with more students, you want to make sure all those students are supported outside the classroom by even yeah. more number of counselors. I think that's a that's a a great point, and, and um, it's something I, I've seen here on, on campus is that the faculty, so in K-12, I think the teachers are more in tuned with um, looking for 
misbehavior issues or right. you know kids acting out that might be some sort of a problem I, I think they're more in tune with that and there's an expectation that when you come to college you don't do that right um, and so when you see somebody acting a little odd um, in class you may not say anything right and um, you know I, I've I've called out uh, about I, I probably in the seven years or so I've been teaching I, I teach one class and, and I'll, the, the act out that I see is kids quit showing up yeah and so when they quit showing up oftentimes they tell their parents they're still in class they tell their parents are still doing everything they're supposed to be doing and because of FERPA regulations the parents really are powerless to check that out right um, and so w we do have a, a, a thing called an undergraduate ombudsman and so when something when uh, you know there's a couple kids that just quit showing up for two or three weeks. I, I call the ombudsman or, or send a name to the ombudsman and say, hey, look, I, can you please check this kid out? You, sometimes they get back to me and they say, thanks, um, he's fine, you know, something else. It was in a car accident or something, you know. Um, but unless you do that, you don't have a way of closing the loop. And then, you know, then they're able to tell all their professors right. that um, this kid's out because of uh, an excused absence or, even if it's for health related reasons, they tell you, you know, usually they don't give me feedback individually. They give me generic feedback saying this person has some sort of a, um, a health related issue and we'll, won't be back in class this semester. So that's happened a couple times. And I think, you know, there's probably some um, depression issues or something like that that um, yeah. no, I think you, manifest. I think you're totally right that the K through 12 teacher is gonna be more in tuned and they, they really should be. Yep because um, they're kids they're as kids, opposed to adults. And, they're, and they know they're going through development, particularly yeah. in, in, well, through all the years, but I think particularly middle school is such a time of, of great swings in emotional. And sometimes in higher ed, you don't take role. I mean, there's just these expectations, and yeah. I, I don't care if you show up for a class or not as long as you know the material and pass the test, right? But, and you're supposed to be developing. You're supposed to, so Your both, own responsibility. Kind of. But both, like, the K-12 and the college are supposed to be getting to know the students. But yeah. the, K, the college, you're supposed to be getting to know them more as a, as a peer and a researcher yeah. and as a, you know, whatever department it is, as someone who's also going to do physics or whatever it is. Right, right. And that's a different... It's a different mindset. That's more of a work relationship. Yeah, yeah. Which, if you're, unless you're someone's supervisor, you're not going to necessarily no. really want to know what's going on at home. <laughs> you know? Right. Um, well, okay, I want to thank you for what you're, everything you and the Veteran Task Force have been doing. I, um, I did something in Arlington a little while ago. It's called Behind the Badge, and you, you, you go through Mini Police Academy. And, mm -hmm. and we went through a simulation, and it involved having to help someone who... Um, was to have been coming to work was drunk and indicated early on they were a veteran. And when the police were reviewing my um, my performance, um, he said, "You know, you might you should have said thank you for your service." And I usually do say that, mm. but I think my hesitation sometimes is I feel like I worry that's becoming almost a, a cliche, an empty cliche. Mm. And as a society, we're not backing it up. So you're backing it up, and I appreciate that you're... I, yeah, when I... So, uh, um, like, Home Depot and Lowe's give you a 10% veterans right, yeah. discount. Um, and I appreciate that. I, I mean, I, to me, that's a great sense of appreciation. Like, um, that it, it's, a, it's, a, it's not huge. I'd go there anyway. Right. Uh, but they didn't have to do it, and they do it. It is embarrassing, though, a little bit when the cashier says, you know, thank you for your service. Um, I, I don't know why. I, some people, I'm sure, don't, you know, don't think anything. Of, I just, I feel it's kind of odd when they they're thanking me for my service. I, you know, I, 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 like I volunteered. I got paid. I, you know, I, <laughs> I, 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 you know, I wasn't drafted. I mean, right.